So, okay, repeat your question. Okay, so uh, here we continue with our questions before the teaching tonight that we are going to uh, think of the evil of our life, but also we're going to turn to the solution by submitting to God and resisting the devil. So the question is, what do we presume to be when we malign our brother? Judges. Okay, we consider ourselves judges or higher or more superior to others. Yes, okay. Bias, prejudiced. Okay, uh, the next question. Uh, why should we be, why not be confident that our plans must come to pass? 13 to 14. Why should we not be confident that our plans must come to pass? Because our life is but a vapor. We don't know what will happen. Okay. We do not know the outcome. Only God knows the outcome. And yet we presume that's going to be a part of the discussion tonight. A part of our pride is that we presume that what we will, will happen. But God's will supersedes ours. Uh, the next question uh, how is our life compared to the fog in this verse, 14? Vapor. It's, a, it's a, like a vapor. What happens to a vapor? It vanishes. It vanishes. It's a mist. Okay. And it, uh, it, it vanishes. It burns away. Okay. Number 15. What ought we to say when we make our plans according to James in this verse, verse 15? What should we always say before we make these statements? If it's God's will. If it's God's will. That's what grandma used to say. Okay. If the Lord wills. Right. And uh, we'll get into this momentarily, but uh, basically with the more spirit-filled life and the prosperity gospel and the many prophetic words coming and going here, whatever. Uh, many people have left that off, if the Lord wills. In fact, there's been a season where many people look down on prayers with that phrase in it, if the Lord wills. But we can see here in the book of James, written by the half-brother of Jesus, that we need to include that in our statements. Uh, we don't say we're going to uh, Chicago tomorrow. We say, if the Lord wills, we will go to Chicago tomorrow or whatever. So uh, I think most of us are surrounded by people, including ourselves, as we look in the mirror, by no longer including those words, if the Lord wills. And here again, that's presumption. And we'll get into that momentarily, okay? Uh, and then our last question in verse 17 what is it when we neglect opportunities for service? What is it when we neglect opportunities for service? Sin. Yeah, sin. For him who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. Okay. So uh, as we look at this fourth chapter, uh, the first half is the pollution in the human heart. Uh, the root of the problem is envy and wicked desires. And there's not one of us here have not had envy of someone or something at one time or another in our life. And we all struggle if we're human with wicked desires. We also see the fruit of the problem, okay? Uh, you know, the wages of sin produces death, we've talked about before. Uh, so what is the wage? What is the fruit? What is the outcome? of this problem of the human heart that is so wicked and so envious. It says in verse one, constant fighting and quarrel, quarreling, uh, murder in verse two, uh, total breakdown in our prayers. We pray and get no results. And uh, we're not asking God for spiritual things. We're only asking God for material things. Uh, we're asking God to endorse our sinful desires. Uh, we become lovers of the world and not righteousness. Uh, and when we do these things, according to the book of James, we grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, we often ignore the Holy Spirit when he prompts us not to do something or we disobey when he says to do something. We should not grieve the Holy Spirit. 
And then we also see the sin in this chapter of slandering, uh, which is that uh, spoken word, but liability or li uh, being liable is more in a legal term and something is published. And, uh, and then we all have to honestly admit, do we have a problem with boasting? Are we boasting uh, too much for roll tide, you know? Is that where our focus is? Uh, are we boasting for your team, uh, for your church, for your group, your, uh, your interests, your hobbies? Uh, Paul said he boasted only in the cross in him who died upon it, Jesus Christ. And so our boasting should be about what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Okay. And then in a few minutes, we'll get to the solution in the human heart. We're just kind of giving you the overview here. Uh, humble yourself. The act alone results in a twofold blessing. How many could handle a twofold blessing tonight? Okay. Uh, first, God will give us grace. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay. And then uh, the other blessing that God promises in this chapter is that God will lift us up. I think if ever in my life or your life, in the time in which we live, we need to be lifted up daily. And we have to lift up the Lord and then be lifted up by him. The problem is that we have questions, we have doubts, we have fears, and we ignore lifting up the Lord and giving him his prominence in our life, our preeminence in our life. Uh, and then we're told to submit to God. That means surrender. Uh, we surrender some areas of our life, but not most of them. And so therefore we have a conflict there. Uh, we have certain rooms in the house of our heart, the rooms of our heart, that we do not let God go there at all. We, uh, they're private, okay? And uh, it could be uh, something immoral. It could be something that is... Um, boastful or proud something we won't let go of and we need to let god into all areas of our life and have dominance there and then we have to resist the devil we're told here in this chapter if we resist the devil if we fight the devil that he will flee us and you remember how jesus himself the son of god the the god incarnate uh was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and nights by Satan himself, and in three major areas he was he was tempted. But it says in all ways Jesus was tempted in this world as we have all been tempted. So uh, don't think that you and I are the only ones who've been tempted. Even Jesus, when he was on the earth, was tempted in all the ways that you and I are tempted. And uh, so resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And how do we resist the devil? One way is we stay in the presence of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord, but we also resist the devil with scripture. And uh, we know that Jesus told Lucifer, Satan, the deceiver, scriptures to counteract the temptation. But we need to be wise when we talk about that today and each day, because the devil knows scripture better than most of us. And therefore he will warp scripture uh, to convince us that it's okay, you know, uh, uh, there's no penalty, there's no judgment for the Christian, so we don't need to, to live a, a moral, clean life. So resist the devil. And then we're told uh, in the latter part of this chapter, we need to repent. Repent means to turn from our sin and go the opposite direction. Uh, normally, we don't go a full turnaround, you know, we just kind of go a few degrees and, and, uh, that way we have one foot in the world, one foot in, in the spiritual realm. Uh, and then we're told to depend on God for our future. Uh, we have wrong actions. And uh, James remarks that his readers uh, have no knowledge of what tomorrow may bring. And so therefore, we have to be careful how we depend on ourselves as opposed to depending on God. And then the concluding part of this whole chapter is the right action. James urges his readers to simply preface their plans by the following words we've already talked about, if the Lord wants us to, if the Lord wills. So as we look at the scripture now, uh, we want to talk about the first subject here, 
that quarrels and conflicts result because of the sin of pleasure. Uh, the wars that we're having in the world today, and we've had many of them in, in my lifetime, uh, somebody wanted somebody else's land, someone else's woman, someone else's power, someone else's money. Uh, we're seeking the wrong things. And uh, it reminds us as the message we talked about one time before, uh, King Ahab desired someone else's vineyard. And, uh, and so therefore, with his evil wife, Jezebel, who's probably the most evil woman in the Bible, uh, they plot to kill uh, and get the, the vineyard. And because of that, God says that's enough. And the kingdom of Ahab and Jezebel fall. And uh, uh, Jezebel is cast down by some of her own people. And the dogs eat every portion of her except her hands. And uh, I guess they were even too evil for the dogs to want to eat. And uh, so therefore, uh, those conflicts have to do with our pleasure. The, the second area that's talked about here in this chapter is lust. Uh, lust is desiring something that is against God, but for the flesh. Uh, and the Bible teaches us here that the lust of the eye leads to the actions within our life. And it could be anything from a person to a cause. It could be uh, some, yeah. type of, some type of... Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, you want to mute? No. Feedback, I guess, because we're in the same general area. So uh, the lust of the eyes leads to evil actions, okay? And then we have one that most of us in this group tonight would say, oh, not us. No one in this group is a murderer. But yet James accuses us of murder. And we talked about this be before in a previous session on James, that even if we think it in our heart, we have committed murder. If we have hatred, if we call somebody a fool, if we... Uh, if we say something that would cause others to stumble, then we are uh, having that to do. Okay, Cheryl? Yes. You want to say something? No, did I act like I want to say something? No, I just heard you. So uh, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I tried to mute. Okay, no problem. So anyway, uh, we have we have to realize that we have murder. And what is the number one murder taking place in our society today? Anyone? Abortion. Abortion, your own attire. So whether we want to face it or not, here in this book of James uh, is the suggestion of murder, which involves even abortion. Now, some of us, no people in our family or our circle of friends who have had abortions. And uh, many did this before they were Christians. Some have even been convinced to have an abortion after they were Christian. But we need to remember that no matter what anyone has done, it can still be forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if a person dwells in sorrow and misery and guilt and shame for committing murder or abortion, uh, then they will be defeated for most of their life. And so therefore we need to realize that even the, the sin of abortion is forgivable under the Lord Jesus's uh, mercy and his grace. So uh, abortion is uh, no longer a hot topic on many of the agendas today but it's still very active. And whenever there, ever one abortion clinic is shut down, another one opens somewhere else, or things have become more private and not as publicized. As, but there are still uh, abortion clinics in our neighborhoods. And we, do, we still have a few Christian groups and churches that go out regularly and march against these abortion clinics. Uh, I remember when our children were younger, 
we used to go to an abortion clinic not too far from where we lived in uh, uh, Virginia. And um, uh, we would stand out there, hold signs. Uh, we'd pray for people. We would counsel people. I was involved with the uh, pregnancy care center for years in two or three different locations, different cities. And uh, thousands of people were spared uh, the guilt and shame and the, the sin of murder because of the uh, abortion um, protesting by faith and um, concern rather than just condemnation and, and uh, some kind of immoral act against the abortionists. Uh, some of you know uh, the local area that we have supported through different churches uh, that help uh, unmarried women who have found themselves pregnant. And uh, we need to consider more about helping these organizations. Uh, we've also had, I believe, uh, Cheryl, you could probably remind us of this. We had uh, someone who came to our group one time and shared the ministry uh, about working with uh, local people. Uh, do you or Raymond remember what I'm talking about? Oh. Uh. We had somebody came, uh, something watch, um, and they came and they shared. Uh, we even had a baby shower for someone. Oh, who... yeah, baby shower for them. Yeah, that was for, uh, what's it? It's called Human Coalition. Yes, 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 human, yes. Human Coalition. Yes, yes. And so that happened two or three years ago. Maybe we need to consider that again, even though we do it by Zoom meeting. Uh, I thought that was a very worthy action of our group is to support someone who was deciding whether to keep their baby or not. And uh, Right. We could do that either through an offering or through a shower, baby shower, or in any way helping with furniture, uh, any type of uh, sufficient help to get someone who is an unmarried person or someone having an unexpected pregnancy. And uh, so we need to do that. So that's a way to prevent uh, the murder or the abortion. Um, and then we go on to uh, the next area talking about envy. Uh, most of us have this problem with envy, and uh, this seems like we're saying these things over and over, but evidently, because James mentions it in each chapter, many of these things are still necessary. And tragically, after 2,000 years, all of the topics that James discusses in his wonderful uh, epistle here are still relevant. So no matter how many people have become Christians, the problems have not been fully resolved. If anything, they have multiplied far greater. And, um, and then we come to the discussion that we mentioned earlier about uh, our main, main problem is we have desired to have friendship with the world rather than friendship with God. Uh, it's amazing how we lower our standards to be with our friends, uh, our buddies, uh, our different clubs, and uh, we're to be in the world, but not of the world. And therefore, that's a problem because many times we get in the world and then our standards begin to weaken. You know, we, we go out with the boys if you're a guy and uh, they go for drinks after work or after a ball game. And then we're tempted and then we attempt it again. And then we start yielding. And uh, the same thing with women in their groups uh, of different interests that they get involved. And they want the favor. They want the friendship with the world. They want to be liked by their friends. And uh, the only true desire of our heart should be, what does God think? People have made fun of that wristband that people wore for years. And that whole cause, what would Jesus do? Uh, they even have people now, what would Joe do? And uh, the thing is that what would Jesus do in the situation at work or after work or in our clubs, our organizations, our team meetings, our, our sports, or whatever, what would Jesus do in that situation? And uh, we've kind of let that just kind of go by the wayside. Uh, but I think it's still relevant today. Uh, it says here, <clears throat> to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. I don't think anyone in this group or anyone listening to this in the future 
would say, well, I'm not an enemy of God, but if we are enemies uh, with God and not know it, it's because we have slowly accepted the approval of man, the, the favor of man as to oppose to the favor of God. And so um, the purpose of this scripture here by James is to draw our hearts back to putting Jesus first. I've shared this a number of times in this group, joy, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Say that with me, Jesus, others, yourself. Joy, Jesus, others, yourself. And somehow most people have yourself and then others and then maybe Jesus, okay? And I don't know what Y-O-J spells, but Yaj does not sound as good as joy. And we need to work on the joy of the Lord. We're also told that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if we put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, then we will have strength to endure the times which we live. Notice this famous verse that we quote all the time. God is opposed to the proud. In the King James, you say, God resists the proud. When I see the, the old King James, I see God's hand pushing against sinful man and even carnal Christians. God resists the proud, but he gives grace. He gives welcome. He gives favor uh, to the humble. And uh, we're told to resist the devil. He will flee from you. How to resist him? With prayer. We resist him by the blood of Jesus by the word of our testimony. Uh, we resist him by scripture. Uh, we resist him by um, taking a stand and allowing God to work through us. And as Cheryl mentioned earlier, we <clears throat> need to cleanse our hands, <clears throat> which basically means whatever our hands find to do, we need to cleanse them. Now we have grown accustomed in the last two years to wash your hands probably more than ever before. Uh, I remember I was told as a child, always wash your hands before you eat. <clears throat> uh, and I didn't understand that at first. Why? You know, it's just dirt. You know, it's just uh, leftover food from some other snack. Uh, but the scripture here is clean, cleanse your hands. That means cleanse your activities. Uh, the word hand in is manual, manual labor. And uh, so anything that involves our doing of things needs to be cleansed. Does this project bring glory to God? We're told in Colossians, as we've shared before, whatever your hand finds to do, do it all to the glory of the Lord. What has your hand found to do this week? Was it honoring to the Lord? Or was it dishonoring to the Lord? Uh, the hand is a symbol of our activity, our habits. And uh, so therefore we need to cleanse our hands and then we need to purify our hearts. Uh, and the only thing that I know that will purify our hearts is the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus. We cleanse, we cleanse our hearts with the blood of Jesus by confession. Uh, and we need a heart transfusion. Our old selfish nature needs to be transfused by the blood of Jesus to where he is in us and through us, perfecting his will in us. Uh, and then we're told that if we do not <clears throat> take this advice from James, that all of our laughter, our joy at our teams winning, uh, our clubs partying, and uh, our weakening our standards that all of that joy all that laughter will turn into misery and we will begin to weep and uh but that's a good sign you know people see most of what's happening in the world today is tragic and sorrowful but this is necessary for god to do the work he needs first in the church the bride of christ the family of god judgment begins in the house of the lord we've shared that the scripture says over and over uh, and we're seeing some traces of that as some leaders are repenting 
Uh, we even have some people in the legislature who are resigning, uh, are, not re are not going to return in the office because they don't want to be involved with all of that corruption anymore. And uh, we need to see that in the church first and then in the public arena second. And that will not happen unless we, the body of Christ, speak up for the righteousness of God. Um, so therefore mourning and gloom and sadness are part of God's process to cleanse our hearts, to purify our hearts. But most of us are not willing to go through that. Uh, but God wants us to have a clean, clean heart. And then we have that famous scripture that many of us sing through the years. It's in verse 10. <clears throat> Humble yourself in the sight, and King James said, of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Sing it with me, although you're still mic'd, okay? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, repeat it. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. And some of you go higher and higher. And he will lift you up. Some say up into heaven and he will lift you up. One more time. Do the echo, do the extra part, wherever you fit in. Don't hold back. Let the joy of the Lord come forth even in this song. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up, and he will lift you up, higher and higher, and he will lift you up, up into heaven, and he will lift you up. If we would just sing that each day as we start the day, the Lord is first, Jesus, others, yourself. Humble yourself. Each one of us need to do that. Otherwise, we'll never have the peace. We'll never have the contentment we need. Um, in this passage of scripture, it's alluded to that God is the husband of the believers. We know the marriage analogy. Jesus is the bridegroom, <clears throat> and the bride is the body of Christ, the church. And yet, uh, we are like adulterers, adulteresses, who have left our first love, and we have a longing to be with someone else. Uh, we'll look at our schedule. If you have a planner, or either on your computer, and you look at your schedule, our first love, the Lord Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, how much of our schedule is focused upon the bridegroom, Christ Jesus? We look at all these activities and what is really first in our life. Most of the things that we put first will all be destroyed. They won't last at all. And yet what we do for Christ will last for eternity. Like we've said many times, just one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So all this activity, going here, there, and preparing for that, and doing these things, how does it fit into God's plan? How does God want us to spend our time? Does he want us to go off somewhere and be a monk or a nun and just sit in a cell and, and read the Bible and pray all the time. No, he wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. In fact, we are commissioned, we're commanded, we're ordered by God to go into all the world. That world may include your office, it may include your contacts on the internet, but we are to be in the world, but focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the prize, he is the goal. And uh, we all know stories about marathons and uh, sporting events where people were handicapped, they were in pain, they were suffering, but they kept their eyes on the prize. And I still see images of those people from the wide world of sports 
who took uh, the last several hours of just crawling to, to the goal line to reach the goal. If we would have more attitudes like that, that, no matter what it takes, no matter what the price, no matter the sacrifice, that we're going to keep our eyes on the prize, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to reach the goal. Remember, it's not how we start. It's how we end. And many people, supposed Christians, drop out of the race altogether. They have disappointments. They go through illness. They lose family members, friends. They lose a job. They lose their aspirations, their hopes, their future careers, their advancement. And they just give up. They drop out of the race of life. But we're told in Hebrews, but let us run with patience, endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The founder of our faith is Jesus Christ keeping our eyes on the goal line, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very interesting, a revelation, this is so simple, it's silly, but I'm gonna share it. Today, I was looking over these notes and I thought about where's our focus? Where is our enmity? Where's our hostility towards God? Uh, sports comes first, television comes first, uh, reading materials that are non- beneficial for the Lord come first and then I put down internet and most of you may or may not know this but if you're talking about the worldwide net internet it always must be capitalized according to punctuation and what is the first letter of internet I ah that brings back the illustration that sin the middle letter is I what is the problem James is talking about what I want not what God wants. And I think that the internet is alluring, it's appealing, it's seductive to pull me and you uh, into areas of temptation and defeat, discouragement, doubt. I think if anything, the internet has caused people to doubt the existence of God, uh, to, to doubt the, uh, the Lord is in control, the sovereignty of God. Uh, and so, we spend hour after hour during the week looking at stories that do not lift up Jesus, but they're focused. Uh, I'm amazed that when I go to different websites, all of a sudden these ads appear to me uh, because they have such algorithms. Some of you could explain that, uh, that have been tailor made to trap, to ensnare broken Oliver. Uh, how in the world do they know I have an interest in, in uh, Victorian literature? Or how do they know that I, I, I like these kind of mysteries? Or, uh, but the people who have developed the internet have thousands of people finding out everything they can about you and me so they can tailor make the advertising to show just the things that we might buy. You know, I buy some things from Amazon from time to time. And then all of a sudden I, I get about a hundred different ads about the same type of item, whether it's something in the office or some kind of device. And all of a sudden I'm bombarded by all the different options. And so uh, the internet is one of our first temptation problems that we have to deal with in our life. Um, One area that he talks about, which most churches have eliminated from their teaching, many home groups have left this out, is the wrath of God. The wrath of God. Uh, look, look at it in verse four and five there. Once we have hostility towards God, that's enmity, uh, then we are expecting uh, some reaction and we think well god's asleep he's not really watching me you know he is he is preoccupied with all the cares of afghanistan or some other country or the poverty in the world uh, and surely the wrath of god would not touch me but i think we need more preaching and teaching not in a hateful spirited 
attitude, but in a loving manner, that the wrath of God is real. And it's going to happen if we continue to be friends with the world, if we tend to be hostile to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then the wrath of God will come against us. <clears throat> it says, do you think that scripture speaks to no purpose when it says he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? It's, it's kind of hard for me to understand. How can God, who is all sufficient, how can God be jealous? You ever thought of that? How can God be grieved at my sinful nature, my misbehavior, uh, my disobedience? But yet the word of God tells us this over and over. God is grieved. The Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we say certain things, when we do certain things. And yet we don't seem to care because our focus is on I, what I want, what I want to do. And so therefore, God is jealous. God can be grieved, not because I say so, but the word of God says so. And James emphasizes it in this chapter. And uh, he desires to have fellowship with us. We talked about this before. Some of you know this, that when we're with other Christians, our spirit bears witness to their spirit. If that spirit is the spirit of the living God, then we're in good shape. But if that spirit of your coworker is evil and we bear witness with them, we link to them, we connect to those people, then we're drawn away from God. So therefore, we need to examine ourselves in our relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. Are we attracted to the things that God wants us to be attracted to? Do we really care about being with God's people? You know, for some people in this group or some church group, it means nothing for them to miss. But to others, it means everything, because this is the time once a week that we get to be with people we love dearly and share the principles of God's word. And to offer hope and encouragement and pray for one another that our sins be forgiven and that our sicknesses be healed. But to others, it means nothing to miss or nothing uh, to fail to assemble themselves. It was interesting that uh, Raymond in his introduction or his invitation to the teaching tonight was back to that scripture, forsake not yourself in the assembly of yourselves even more so in the latter days. I believe we're in those latter days. And it's far greater for us not to withdraw from the body of Christ. It's far imp more important for us to draw closer to each other. The days will come when there'll be few and far between where we will have a sanctuary, where we'll have a refuge, where we'll have a place that people will pray for us and love us and accept us whether we've done everything we should have done or not. And so, therefore, we need to be very careful to believe that God is jealous. He wants our first priority. He wants our first date. He wants our first dance at the, at the, at the dance of life. Yes, it's all right, Baptists. It's all right to dance. In fact, we're commanded to do so in the Old Testament. Uh, people come before the Lord with dancing, singing, clapping. Can you believe that? in the fellowship of other Christians, shouting, how shameful, shouting. I don't want to go to that place. You see how noisy those people can be? But it's amazing if you go to the same type of event for football or basketball, Duke basketball or whatever, people can shout, they can jump around, they can dance, they can paint their bodies all kinds of crazy ways in their enthusiasm for their pleasures and the focus of their heart. God wants us to be excited. Do any of you remember when you first saw the love of your life that God has allowed you to have on the earth? I can still see Karen visiting the church where I was working. And uh, I saw her and I thought, wow, she's got the whole package. You know, and she's got the look, she's got the eyes, the smile, the personality, she's got the sweetness. She's got the hair, 
And I knew when I first saw her visiting a church where I was serving in Miami, Florida. And I knew she was the one. And eight months later, she was the one, the only one. We need to have even far greater love for the Lord Jesus. Uh, we've had our ups and downs in our marriage, like most of you, if you're human. Uh, but the first several years of our marriage, Karen adored me. Can you believe anybody would adore me? She loved me. She couldn't do enough for me. She bought me expensive gifts. Uh, she did everything she could, sacrificing during our courtship and then after our marriage, all the way up until at least our first or second child. And uh, I told her over and over, Karen, the kind of worship, the adoration you're giving only belongs to God. It only belongs to Jesus. We must not make any person, whether it's our spouse, our friend, our children, our grandchildren, nothing should come before our love for the Lord. And that's a hard lesson to learn and to keep on learning over and over. Jesus wants to be our first love in the right order. Psalm 1611 says, in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Are you looking for pleasure in the world? Are you looking for happiness? There it is, Psalm 16, verse 11. In God's presence, Jesus' presence is fullness. That's like overflowing joy, fullness of joy. And at his right hand, his right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're looking in the wrong places. We're looking for happiness, significance, importance in all the wrong areas. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it's not becoming a monk, a friar, uh, some priest in a cell somewhere or a nun off in some uh, medical place around the world. It's in the presence of the Lord, wherever that might be. For most of us, it's Wake County or uh, nearby counties and we need to realize that that's where our source of joy and that's where our pleasure must be found this other is only like a mist it's like a fog it will pass away in the heat of the day why do people kill why do they allow abortion why do they don't say anything why don't they do anything about it it's because they are rejecting God. God says that we are made in his image. And so whenever we hate and destroy in our mind or we kill with our hand, we're actually killing the image of God, the creation of God. We should find in God what life really is all about, not in sports not in literature, not in stories, not in television, not in all these things that we wrap ourselves in. It says here that failure to be satisfied in God is the ultimate failure. If God's not enough, beloved, if nothing will ever be. And people go from person to person, relationship to relationship, church to church, group to group, club to club, sports to sports, they go seeking, and God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things that we think we need will be, shall be added unto us. The scripture says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found, which causes us to wonder, is there a point we can go where uh, God will pull away, he will withdraw because of our lack of putting him first place? Man was made in God's image. And so when we love our fellow man and we care for our fellow man, then we're showing respect and honor to God and his image. Karen's going to read a 
a verse for us in Daniel chapter 4, 31 through 32. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle in seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Nebuchadnezzar, big long name, king of Babylon. He became one of the greatest men in ancient history. And uh, he became so proud of his accomplishments, his relationships, his wealth, that he defied the living God. And as we see here in the scripture in Daniel chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, that God caused him to lose his place of sovereignty. He was no longer the king. And he went crazy, he went insane. And for seven years, this great, mighty, proud king was humbled, brought down to the utter destruction. And he was out there in the fields eating grass like a wild animal. And... Uh, unaware of what was actually happening in his life because he had become so proud of he, what he had done as opposed to what God wanted to do through him. Uh, we have many other people. We could bring, bring that same discussion to people in politics, people in the, in the churches, uh, evangelists, television evangelists that had accomplished great wealth, great notoriety, great uh, public acclaim, adoration, and they did not give God the glory. We know about Herod in the New Testament <clears throat> when uh, he was speaking and the people said uh, he speaks like the voice of God and they have claimed him as such, such a noble king full of accomplishments and he did not defer the praise to Almighty God. Defer is a word that most of us don't practice regularly, but if the proper dress code for a wedding is shoes and not sandals, then we go to the trouble of wearing shoes. Uh, if it's wearing uh, proper clothing or proper etiquettes at a wedding or a funeral, uh, then we defer our own desire to be ourselves, to show sympathy or agreement uh, with the people that we're honoring, either at the wedding or a funeral or some other event. Uh, and so therefore, uh, when King Herod took all of the glory himself, uh, the Bible says that God smote him and that he was eaten up from worms within because he did not defer, he did not give God the glory. That old chorus is still true. Rise and shine and give God the glory. Rise and shine. Give God the glory. That's in Isaiah probably 61. Using the word arise. Get up. Each day. And give God the glory. You've lived another night. You've a new day. To honor the Lord. By your behavior. Your words. Your conversation. Your citizenship. Rise and shine and give God the glory. Otherwise, we can become like Nebuchadnezzar. We can become like many of the people we've discussed in public life. We can become like Herod and be destroyed by our own arrogance and pride. We need to recognize that the most high God is ruler, sovereign, over the realm of mankind, the whole world, and that he bestows it to whomever he wishes. God will give us authority. He will give us leadership responsibilities. He will give us rewards if we give him the place of preeminence. This is true in the time of James. It is true today. 
overcoming pride and arrogance. As we close this chapter, this last section here, uh, we must learn to come back, as we said earlier, to adding the words, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. So we should not say, uh, tomorrow I will fly to Atlanta and go to this convention. No. The way the airlines are working nowadays, that may not work for several days. You think those thousands of people who are stranded by Southwest Airlines uh, knew that when they said, oh, I'm going to so-and-so place, that they would wait for days and days, dealing with cancellations, stranded airports, no place to stay. Even the hotels, many of them around the airports cannot even open because they don't have people to work in those motels, those hotels. So James is talking about pride and arrogance and how those two things show up in subtle ways. He says, you boast in arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And that's hard to accept that. All such boasting is evil. I mean, I could see it's, it's not nice, maybe, uh, or it's debatable. But James says it's not debatable. It's evil. So when we boast of what we're going to do, we leave out if the Lord wills. We put ourselves in a category of pride that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is why the proud preoccupy themselves with looking down on others. They think they're up here and they're judging everyone else, look at what they're wearing. Just listen to that incorrect English. Just look at that high skirt, that low cut blouse. Just look at that tattoo. Look at those piercings. And we condemn people on the exterior when God is looking at the interior. The tragedy is many of those in the church, those who claim to be in the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, uh, are much more repulsive to God on the inside than those people with all those marks on the outside. It's difficult for me at times to watch certain worship services, uh, certain events, Christian events, and you see people covered with tattoos and piercings everywhere, and I pray that the Lord would help them to understand that they should reflect uh, the Lord Jesus, not themselves. I'm still here. It's worth the moment, okay? Well, I thought I was here. Yes, this is the this is what I put together to show what this is all about. Here's a picture of Jesus Christ, but the border is a zebra skin, and the zebra skin gets the attention more than the picture of Jesus. And that's the way it is in my life at times, in your life at times, and most of the world at times, that the attention is given to the border and not the personage of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when people get up and they half dress and they're acting inappropriately and they worship the Lord, many times the frame takes over the thought processes of those who are watching and they fail to realize that Jesus is the focus not the zebra skin border when you take the categories of temptation into consideration here in the end chapters in verses here 
uh, we see that there's three things that are discussed, okay? There's pride, there's atheism where they doubt God and have nothing to do with God, and, uh, and then denial of God's word in our life. James is saying, quit being a friend of the world, forget being arrogant, proud, thinking you're better than others, judging people for their outward appearance when God is looking at the heart. And uh, it may be simpler just to proclaim uh, that the Lord is full of grace, not Mary. That's a false teaching. Hail Mary, full of grace. No, she was a sinner. She was a human being who needed a savior, even her son, Jesus Christ. It is God who is full of grace. And on behalf of us, he uses that grace. James says that not believing in the sovereign rights of God to manage the details of our future is arrogance. So if we deny that God is in control of our lives, God is in control of our planning, our planner, our schedule, then that's arrogance. The way to battle arrogance, this, this is the point as we conclude, is to yield to the sovereignty of God in all the details of life. So as we make decisions, does this conform to the image of Christ? Does this draw people to Jesus or to us? Does it take people to a proper view of God or to our borders? And we're to rest in the infallible promises to show God mighty on our behalf. And Karen, if you'd read 2 Chronicles 16, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that we must show ourselves completely yielded to the Lord who is mighty on our behalf. 2 Chronicles 16, 21. In 16, 9. 16 9 yes for the eyes of the lord move to and fro from throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his you have acted foolishly in this indeed from now on you will be surely have wars okay so it says here that the eyes of the lord not broken over not raymond at water not anybody in this group not any denominational leader not any church group leader the eyes of the lord God, the Holy Spirit, are going to and fro over all the earth, looking for someone whose heart is totally yielded, surrendered to the Lord himself. And then we see in Psalm 23, verse 6, that we have a goal to pursue God. Psalm 23, 6, we all know this verse. Surely, goodness and mercy shall Follow me all the days of my life. And hallelujah, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our pursuit, is to have goodness and mercy from the Lord so that we one day will have a place in heaven in the presence of Almighty God. Isaiah 64, verse 4 is a familiar verse we quote all the time, but it's very difficult to practice. Isaiah 64, 4. Karen? No, I don't have that one. I'll look it up. Isaiah 64, 4. Yes. For from of old they have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither has the eye seen a God besides thee, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for him. Okay, so the ones who wait or serve the Lord has a sovereign, almighty God, omniscient, om omnipotent, omnipresent God who will benefit us, okay? And then he wants to equip us to live for his glory. And uh, Hebrews 13, 21, Hebrews 13, 21. 
equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Read that again and think about this. We don't have to do any of it except obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Notice that he himself will equip us. Most of you know about the shooting at a movie set out in uh, the West. And uh, they used someone to check the gun who had had failures in other movies and was a very poor prop manager. And they use someone, and then this actor takes a gun and shoots it in the filming or the rehearsal of the filming and kills the cinematographer and wounds the director. And that's because uh, the person who was involved did not equip the actor, the producer, the set with the proper things. There should have been no live ammunition in a prop gun, or even using a real gun. And someone has to equip the people who act in these plays, these movies, these dramas, these television shows. And likewise, the Bible says here, God himself is the producer of life and life hereafter. And he will equip us. Read it again, Hebrews 13, 21. Equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Lord Jesus is our equipper. And if you know the scripture, you know that the leaders of the church are not to do the work of the ministry. Oh, that sounds horrible. But if you know the scripture, it says the leaders, the spiritual leaders, are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So the leaders should stay in the word of God. They should practice it by their own example and be an example in word and deed so that the members of the congregation or the Bible study or whatever are equipped to go and do the work of the ministry. God never expected the pastors of the churches and spiritual leaders in the community to do all this work. It's to equip the saints to do the work. And God himself sets the example. He equips the leaders. He equips the individual members of the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. In other words, the remedy for pride is unwavering faith in God's sovereign grace. God is first. He is our pleasure. He is our joy. He is our motivation for our next breath. Not some other activity we have convinced ourselves has a high priority. A tough lesson. James did not leave one of us alone tonight. And I ask you to read this over again and ask God to reveal areas, as I've been doing myself, reveal areas in our life where we need to change our priorities. And let God be God. And let our enemies be scattered. For the glory of God, we commit these teachings. In Jesus' name, amen.